people generally don't give a damn about killing you. If you resist, you will be shot. Unless you have a gun, then you could attempt to fire back. But uh, the best advice is not to, not to resist. South Africa is being confronted with an ever-growing wave of violence. The statistics are alarming. A murder is committed every hour. Every five minutes, a car is stolen. In 1993 alone, 212 policemen were killed during service. With a population of around 35 million, 240,000 burglaries were registered last year. Culture of crime is part of the history of, of, of apartheid as well, because the, the legend that there's crime is real, okay? I mean, if you talk to, if you walk down the street now and you said to somebody who's never been mugged in their life, what do you think about crime? They would say it's very bad. The, the fact of the matter is our commitment is to expose the levels of crime. It was never done before. There was never a, a, a commitment and a will from government to say there is a crime problem in South Africa because it would not have looked good to have a, a, an apartheid regime which was able to uh, monitor the lives of people in every way but could not contain crime. Criminal can act in South Africa almost with uh, impunity because he knows he's only, there's only a 50% chance of him being caught. B, there is no uh, death penalty, so he can shoot someone, and if he's caught, he can expect a seven or eight year jail sentence. And after, with remission, that could, he could be out within five years. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the case of Lauren Dickerson, who will be on trial for apparent murder next year, but that is quite a hectic case so I'll leave it linked here if you would like to watch it. But today we are talking about a case that is still unsolved to this day, sorry, spoiler alert, but this case still haunts many people and specifically women within South Africa because a man who apparently committed these crimes is still on the run and we could be mingling with them every single day. But also what is more terrifying is that the serial killer, some speculate, has made a recent appearance again. This case is going to take place in the Peter Maritzburg area. And with that all being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are heading to the east coast of South Africa, to KwaZulu-Natal, specifically the capital named Peter Maritzburg. And we are going slightly back in time to the late 1990s. On this channel, we have spoken about it before, where post-apartheid 1994 in South Africa, there was an immense rise of crime after apartheid had ended. And we know very well that there was a very large and quick increase in serial killers. And here on this channel, we have already spoken about two of these serial killers. One being Norman Simons or the Station Strangler, Remember, he murdered around 20 boys, which was an incredibly hectic case to talk about. And then there was also Moses Atole, who ran wild for around a year between 1994 and 1995, when he was apprehended in 95. But he was sentenced to over 2,000 years in prison. So these were very, very brutal and violent crimes, but there were a lot more. However, most of the serial killers post-94 were either caught by police or or they happen to take their own lives. However, one managed to escape, and that's the one that we're gonna talk about today. Women in Peter Maritzburg were going missing left, right, and center, and their bodies wouldn't be found for days or months later. And generally, with serial killers, they mostly have an MO or modus operandi. So what do these victims have in common, you may ask? Well, they were all being murdered by someone known as the Sleepy Hollow Killer. The Sleepy Hollow Killer has still not been caught by police and spoiler alert, like I said earlier, he very well might never be caught. But from the late 1990s to 2007, the Sleepy Hollow Killer was roaming our streets and preying on our women. Now jobs in South Africa, even now, are very difficult to come by. You have to be very skilled or you just have to know someone who knows someone and that's how you get in. Sometimes, I'm not saying all jobs, but most of the time it's difficult to get a job here. So people in South Africa are either very creative, they try and make ends meet as, as best as they can, 
or to just ensure that there is food and so that they can provide for their family. Now, sex work in South Africa, I really thought it was legal. I swear I heard it on the radio one day, but I swear wrong, clearly, because when I looked it up, it is still highly illegal in South Africa to be part or to even take part in any type of sex work. And the reason why I thought it was actually legal is because I've noticed that police don't really pay any attention to any sex workers, be that male or female. But I also think that it also plays both ways in, in terms of the police. And yes, I could say, okay, cool, I've noticed that police aren't necessarily arresting these men or women. But I also noticed that the police may not try and protect these men or women either. So I think for a lot of men and women who are in the sex working trade that I think they may have felt or still feel that they can't come to police when a crime is committed because one, it is illegal and two, I really don't think that the police care very much for our sex workers which of course is incredibly sad. And I also think that there is this massive stigma for the men and women who choose to work in this line of work. And they do also put their lives at risk every day just to put food on the table most of the time. But anyway, I'm clearly digressing, a very chatty Cathy today. So we are in Peter Maritzburg. It is now the late 1990s and I've introduced now sex workers to you and the Sleepy Hollow Killer. There are many women that are going missing and many of these women who are going missing are sex workers. No one is either reporting them going missing, no one is coming forward about these women going missing and no one is really caring too much about these bodies that are landing up on this freeway. However, police can't just ignore bodies that are piling up and that are found so publicly on South African roads. But when there were more and more women who were being found on the roads of South Africa, police started to notice one thing that was in common with all these women. And that was that all the women were found in the Peter Maritzburg area on the N3 highway and also they had all been strangled with their own panties. And they also noticed that each woman that was found, like I said, was strangled with their own panties, but they had also been so clearly the serial killer had a very specific MO and that was one of sex workers, two strangulation via their own underwear and three to them. So between the late 1990s and 2006, this sleepy hollow killer or serial killer managed to murder 13 different sex workers. So because a lot of the women's bodies were never claimed, they were never identified, no one ever came forward for these women, a lot of them were buried in graves in the area of Mountain Rise and Mpopomeni. So if we just take a step back, 13 different sex workers were found on the N3 highway in Peter Maritzburg. All deceased the same way, strangulation with their own panties, and they had all been Police had a very difficult time with these cases. Yes, they were trying very, very hard to solve them. A lot of people felt that the police maybe could have tried harder. So, 2001 comes along. There have now been at least seven bodies found on this N3 highway. Remember, in total, there were 13. But in 2001, there were already seven bodies. And police had started an inquest on trying to solve these murders. It was unclear in any of the articles that I read what race these women were, but out of the 13 total victims, only three women were ever identified. And one of the ladies to be identified was Nomusa Dolomo, Priti Shalembe, and Adrina Mbokazi. So 2001, the inquest started. So police had now tried to work on this case. It's 2001. They're trying to gather as much information that they have on the seven bodies that have so far been murdered. A lot of the bodies had already been buried years ago. So they really had little to no evidence at all for this case. And because there was little to no evidence, the police officers in the South African police services actually closed this case and nothing went forward. And the bodies kept piling up. Like I said, there were 13 in total up to 2006. So the bodies kept piling up, but they never thought to reopen this case, even though more bodies were piling up. During the time that police were trying to actually look into something during the 2001 period, they did actually exhume a few of the bodies that were already buried. And the reason that they wanted to exhume these bodies were because they wanted to try and identify the ladies that were buried there. And they wanted to try and do some, some facial recognition, but it was never successful. And if it was ever successful, there were no photographs released. I haven't found any. So nothing really came of that, I assume. 
So police have now closed this case, 13 bodies have now piled up, and now it is 2007. And during 2007, between February and October, another three bodies landed up near the N3 highway in Peter Maritzburg. All three of these ladies that were found on this highway were black women. One lady was found behind ML Sultan High School, the second near Liberty Midlands Mall in June, and the last lady to be found was found in October between Hilton and Peter Brown Drive. And just like the 1990s and early 2000 victims, all of these ladies were strangled with their panties and they had all been But police did notice something very, very different between these three women was that all the 1990s victims, they had all just had those three, the panties and the sexual assault. However, these women also had those, but all three of them had been severely burnt, almost to the place of no recognition at all. But because of the severity and because these crimes were so public, they were literally on the side of the road on a national highway. And because they were so public, the news started to actually pick up with this case. And this case started to gain some traction. People started to hear about the Sleepy Hollow Killer, but there was still no evidence. But because the news was reporting about them, places such as Bloemfontein, places such as Port Elizabeth, the police also noticed there that there were also women being found with panties around their neck, strangled to death, and also who had been so was the Sleepy Hollow Killer moving between provinces as well? Because Bloemfontein and Peter Maritzburg are very far in distance, so he would have to travel there with a purpose. Maybe the Sleepy Hollow Killer was moving for work. I mean, he could have been a truck driver. He could have been someone who moves between provinces for purposes like work, or maybe he has family between provinces. So this is all plausible. And I wonder if police actually looked into any of this back in the day. But I also think it's difficult because all of the women who were victims, as far as we know, had been murdered. There were no victims who were alive to even give a description of this man. So we know nothing about what he looks like. Now, after all of this, a man named Superintendent Henry Budrum from the South African Police Services, he would announce that a special task team had now been created in order to try and solve these murders after 2007, because they finally put a link that there's obviously some serial killer who's not going to stop killing. But this task team was run by Senior Superintendent Gops Governor, and he would go through everything and he would examine all the evidence and try and piece together who this person could be. He was looking at all the circumstances, the modus operandi, the material evidence for all the cases, including the 1990 cases and the recent ones now in 2007. But the only person ever, as far as the reports that I could read went, only one person ever was arrested in connection with any of these murders. And this was on the 30th of January, 2008. 32-year-old man was arrested in Mpopomeni for allegedly murdering a 30-year-old female near Hoek. Sadly, her body was found in a forest by a passerby. She was partially naked with a belt tying her legs and hands, and she had very, very devastating open wounds to her head, and it was alleged that she may have been now, when trying to actually look into this case and how they even thumb sucked this 32 year old man to be able to arrest him, it seems as though this 32 year old man was friends or a potential lover of this 30 year old woman, and that's why he was arrested. But when looking into this case, the senior superintendent, Gops Governor, said that this 32 year old man who allegedly murdered this woman in the forest had nothing to do with the 13 or 16 other women who had been murdered via the serial killer. But there are clearly a lot of buts in this case. Because this case was gaining more traction, there were a lot of investigators on this case. And I did also read some reports that Gerard Labaskachny was somehow involved in his cases as well. But I think he was just managing one of the psychologists who was sent to look at this case. And even though the modus operandi with the early 1990s victims seem to have now shifted to 2007 victims, remember the first victims were not burnt and the recent ones were, a senior investigator on another case was asked to give their opinion to the media and even though they had nothing to do with this case, they were asked a question about how they believe that the modus operandi has changed between 1990 to 2007. And this investigator said that the change in modus operandi can really be explained very easily. 
and they said, quote, recent and earlier murder scenes could be explained. Serial killers have been known to change their modus operandi at times to adapt to prevailing circumstances. For example, media coverage of the earlier killing spree may have caused the assailant to want to cover his tracks, resulting in the burning of bodies to make identification more difficult. Serial killers are usually highly intelligent and they read newspapers. We knew he would not stop. A serial killer never stops killing. Now police had to answer for why nothing was being done. And I think for a lot of people who aren't in the police services, it looks like nothing's being done. And often or not in South Africa, it kind of is that nothing is being done. But no one was being caught. They had no inkling to anybody who could be responsible for any of these serial murders. And when police were questioned by the media about why nothing was being done, they did give reasons and they said reasons such as, quote, they were major stumbling blocks that could have actually affected the outcome of this case. The stumbling blocks included things such as lack of support, resources, and things such as transport were a major stumbling block faced by the investigators of the Sleepy Hollow investigators. Police also said that team members were allegedly not allowed to only focus on the Sleepy Hollow investigations, which does confuse me because I thought that one of the senior inspectors said that there was a task team open specifically for the Sleepy Hollow killers, but apparently they weren't allowed to only focus on this. Police did have to look and focus a lot of their time into the serial murderer, but they also had to do other police tasks as well and focus on other murders as well. And also this task team that was set up for this, they obviously had original members that were part of the team however people were getting taken away from the task team they were moving jobs one person i read also got into a horrific car accident so they were losing people who were integral to the official task team originally and obviously they had knowledge and insight about what these different cases were they went to have a look at the bodies and then you bring in someone completely new who has absolutely no knowledge about the case and they have to start from scratch all the time so it's a constant delay, a constant misinformation going through basically broken telephone if nothing is written down. So this case is apparently still ongoing, but one of the directors of Kuzun Natal's organized crime unit named director Johan Boysen, he said, Quote, no investigations ever cease completely. I cannot say whether or not that the investigation was in fact closed or not. It is so that sometimes investigations reach a dead end. But if new leads come to light, we will continue again. So if you are as confused as I am by that statement, then you are not alone. I think it is very difficult to understand whether someone is actually looking into this case now, right now. And I highly doubt that they are, which is incredibly sad. Like I said, these women are people's mothers, people's sisters, people's daughters, people's loved ones. And so many women are unidentified and their families might not even know where they are. Now, before we end this case, I think that the important question is whether the fates of these women were not really regarded as sufficiently important enough for police to really put their heads down and really put as much energy and task teams into this case as they could. And it also makes me wonder if many lives could have been saved if maybe police had really put a lot of effort in when they first found the original bodies. And I guess you could argue maybe there would have been no change anyway because there was no evidence. We don't really know. And I also find it really disturbing that how many of us could have been in contact with the Sleepy Hollow Killer. Because he, she, we don't know. We don't know if there are more people involved, but we could have been in contact with them at some point of our lives, especially if we live in the Peter Maritzburg area. But that is all for today. Thank you very much for watching this far and for all your love, support. I really appreciate every single one of you. You're all very, very kind. Please stay safe out there. And I hope you all have a fantastic day further and I'll see you again next week. Bye.